Thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is uh, joint work with Charles Pfefferman, uh, Sergei Ivanov and Marty Lassas. Uh, so uh, one of the main challenges in high dimensional data analysis is dealing with the exponential growth of the computational and sample complexity of generic inference tasks as a function of the dimension. And this phenomenon is, is known as the curse of dimensionality. Uh, one intuition that has been put forward to diminish the impact of this curse is that high dimensional data uh, tend to lie uh, in the vicinity of a low dimensional submanifold of the ambient space. And uh, the and algorithms and analysis that are based on this hypothesis are known as uh, uh, form the subfield of manifold learning in uh, machine learning. So here is a genus two surface. It's a two dimensional submanifold of R three, and it's an example of a lower dimensional submanifold of the ambient space. So let me now give you one real situation where uh, it's conceivable that our model is, is reasonable. So in cryo-electron microscopy, uh, a beam of electrons is fired into a, uh, into a, a thin uh, uh, layer of vitreous ice that contains uh, uh, macromolecules in different orientations. So maybe a thousand such macromolecules will be embedded in this thin layer of ice an electron beam will go and will hit it and its shadow will be observed behind on a screen. The shadow measures something like a line integral of the electron cloud as the electron passes through this electron cloud corresponding to the macromolecules. And this, from this shadow of different molecules in different orientations, one tries to uh, 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 reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of the macromolecule. Here is an example of such a picture. You see lots of these Macro, uh, macromolecules in different orientations. And as you see, they look different. And from all of these pictures, one has to uh, uh, reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of the, of the macromolecule. That is the challenge. And here is one particular uh, virus. It's a bacteriophage. It attacks bacteria. It's called HK97. Uh, so this is a, a 200 cross 200 pixel image. As you see, it's quite noisy. And uh, so a single cryo -EM image, such as the one we have, has, uh, let's say, 40,000 pixels, which is the one in the previous slide. And each data point, therefore, is a vector in 40,000 dimensional Euclidean space. If the noise were zero, then these points ought to approximately lie in a projection of an orbit of uh, the group SO3 of rotations of R3 orientation preserving rotations of R3. And this is a three-dimensional manifold. Of, I just showed you a picture of a manifold in a few slides ago. So, so this is actually a three-dimensional such surface. Uh, it's an, uh, not a two-dimensional, but a three-dimensional such surface. And uh, uh, because each such rotation of the, uh, of the macromolecule in question leads to a different picture, each data, the data points are parameterized by elements of this group. Okay, so you take a macromolecule, you perform a certain rotation to it, and then you let the electron beam go through it, you get one image. If you perform a different rotation, let the electron beam go through it, you get to a different image. And all of these images are parameterized by the particular rotation you make. It's a projection because uh, we are no longer ob observing the full three-dimensional structure. We are, we, are, we are projecting it onto a screen, and that results in the projection. But if the molecule is generic, for example, it doesn't contain icosahedral symmetries which some viruses contain, then you expect that the surface of all possible images is actually diffeomorphic to SO3. That is, uh, up to differentiable transformations, the same as SO3. And this is what we'll, uh, we'll assume uh, in, in, in this talk. So when the variance of the noise is low, I'm sorry, so however, the signal to noise ratios in this question is, are quite small, generally no longer than 0.1 in terms of energy. So this motivates the question of denoising data that is generated from a low dimensional submanifold of a high dimensional Euclidean space. The low dimensional submanifold for us was three dimensional manifold uh, diffeomorphic to SO3. The high dimensional ambient space was say, let's say 40,000 dimensions corresponding to the images. 
and the variance of the noise is high because the noise of this of the uh, observation process is high so when the noise is low there this question has already been addressed in some previous work uh, but uh, today i'm going to talk about what happens when the noise is large so this is the this is what we're going to assume we're going to assume that m0 the or the manifold which is unknown it's you think of this as the manifold of all denoised images obtained by doing cryo em so completely noiseless but this is, is unknown what we know is the noisy version uh, so we assume that m0 is a d dimensional c21 submanifold what this means is that the the extrinsic curvatures are one lipschitz functions on the manifold let k0 be the convex hull of m0 so this is this m0 is embedded in some high dimensional euclidean space so we can talk about its convex hull we are going to assume that m0 is contained in the boundary of the convex of of its convex hull namely the boundary of k0 so no point of m0 is somehow in the interior of its convex hull they are all boundary points in the convex hull and this whole convex body is contained inside a unit ball in rn if we also suppose that m0 has volume d dimensional less or equal to capital v and reach which i'll tell you what is is greater or equal to tau so the reach is of a manifold is uh, the largest tube you can put around the points of the manifold such that the tube does not self intersect okay, so this is the definition of the reach and we denote this class of manifolds by g d n v tau mm -hmm. doesn't satisfy this convex hull condition yeah it doesn't so we expect this to be satisfied only in high core dimension in 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 high core dimension there's enough freedom that when you start perturbing them they will not lie in their convex hull in one when you have bounds on the reach and uh, 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 volume but but in in low dimensions as you said it is often going to be the case that they are interior points yeah so so for example if you take a circle the the largest radius tube that you can take without the tube de developing self intersections is is simply the the radius of the of the circle in r2 because any anything less than this it has a nice well defined tube so it's a supremum of all rate of all radii such that when you take the tube around this circle you get a non self intersecting uh, uh tube okay so for tube for 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 circles For s one contained in r two the 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 reach is simply equal to one or the radius for a circle if you have two parallel lines at a distance of two tau from each other then the reach is not infinite the reach is actually just tau because when you look at the tube of radius tau at this point the tube starts self intersecting there are two parallel lines in r2 so but so the, as long as that the 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 radius of the tube is less than tau the tubes don't self intersect but once you reach tau they the meet at the middle this entire line would be a be common so this is why the reach of two parallel lines of radius of of distance two tau from each other is exactly equal to tau uh so generally curvature is also uh, uh, you know looked at uh, is taken into account in this so for example uh, if you have a uh, something like this the reach is going to be roughly what corresponds to this radius because uh, at this point when you take the tubes they will start developing some sort of singularities uh, if you have a very smooth curve like this the reach is going to be larger because you can take larger tubes okay and finally let me tell you a precise definition of the reach that has got nothing to do with this it is the following it is the the, the maximum r such that for all r prime less than r if the distance of x to m the manifold is equal to r prime then there is a unique projection of x on m a unique projection simply means unique nearest point so this is this is the reach uh, this is what we mean by the reach
so uh, so when so let me now start with some examples of when uh, the convex hulls of these manifolds actually uh, have in their boundary the entire manifold so in in r2 if you want that to be the case you need your curve to be the boundary of a of a convex set strictly convex set we'll require strict convexity also later in r3 there is more flexibility already so if you have a curve in r3 it's good enough to just embed this curve in the boundary of the unit ball if you do that then the then the convex hull of this curve is going to in its boundary contain the entire curve simply because uh, the the boundary of a even larger set namely the 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 the, the entire ball uh, contains this curve okay. so so now i'll, I'll start with the actual uh, model so the model is let uh, x1 x2 xn be a sequence of points chosen iid at random from a prob from a uniform measure on the manifold let g sigma be this gaussian distribution which is added noise and uh, whose formula i have given it's just a standard gaussian but with standard deviation sigma and now you what you observe is the random point on the manifold plus this noise and you you observe this many times and from this one has to recover the manifold Uh, in in some sense, and by in some sense I mean close in a distance, a so-called distance called Hausdorff distance, and uh, uh, and the we would like the reach of the output manifold also to be not much smaller than the reach of the original manifold. So these are the constraints. So for example, here the red manifold is a true manifold. What we produce is maybe this dashed blue manifold. and it's we produce an implicit description of this manifold also with the property that the reach is at least tau by d to the 6 where d is the intrinsic dimension and also it is uh, in hausdorff distance rather close what do we mean by hausdorff distance we mean that every point on the blue manifold should be within a distance epsilon double prime of the the red manifold every point in the red manifold should be within a distance epsilon double prime of the blue manifold so this the, these two conditions together ensure that the hausdorff distance to m0 is less than epsilon double prime so now this is the quantitative form of that be contained being contained in the boundary of the convex hull what this is saying is uh, we we require that the manifold is r exposed what this means is that for every point on the manifold it's possible to take a sphere of radius r that contains the manifold and is tangent to the manifold at a point here is a picture so this is the manifold on the side and this is a ball that ensures that this point p satisfies the r exposed condition this condition has to be true for every point of the manifold for every point of the manifold you should be able to find a ball like this that contains the 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 manifold and the boundary of the ball should be tangent to the manifold at the specified point okay so this is r expositeness this is stronger than saying that the manifold is just contained inside the boundary of its convex this is a quantitative version of that statement it holds for some r it holds for all large yes if it holds for some r it will hold for all larger r also so uh, this is just to say that the r expositeness starts being generic in high dimension high co dimension so if the co dimension is very large then you can kind of perturb the manifold and make it r exposed so it's just to say that in high dimensions you start seeing lots of r exposed manifolds this as pius pointed out is not necessarily true in the co dimension is small but it starts being true in high dimension and one way to see this is to simply take take the manifold in in high in high co dimension it's going to be almost contained inside a a linear subspace of much smaller dimension because of the constraints on the reach and the volume and then you just project it onto a very large sphere and then because it's now on a sphere by the arguments we saw earlier it's going to be contained in the boundary of its convex and if the sphere is large this 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 projection will not move the manifold by much uh so so now the, our whole uh, you know algorithm involves a preprocessing step which is done using principal component analysis but the basic idea is that uh, when you have these manifolds with bounded volume upper bounded volume and lower bounded reach this sort of it forces them to kind of approximately lie inside a subspace of relatively small dimension one way to see this is that you can take an epsilon net of the manifold and you can just 
uh, take the linear span of that epsilon net and by definition the uh, manifold will be very close to that subspace but also uh, uh, you know the uh, there exist epsilon nets with not too many points because uh, uh, this is a property of the volume and reach together they imply that so this is just saying that when you project and this, this statement is saying that when you project onto these low dimensional subspaces obtained in this form, you continue to be R exposed. You don't lose the R exposed at this property. You lose a factor of two, which is not too bad. Okay, so, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these noisy data. We're going to do principal component analysis, namely look at the inertia matrix of all the points, expectation of uh, X, X transpose and, uh, you know, uh, diagonalize it and look at the large eigenvalues and uh, simply large eigenvectors and I, uh, large eigenvalue corresponding to which the, you get these eigenvectors and you project onto the span of these eigenvectors, not too many of them. You take the top, top D eigenvectors and project on the span. So this is going to be a pro process that, that uh, essentially contains uh, uh, the manifold. It doesn't contain it in, in a set theoretic sense, but the metric distance between the image under the projection and the manifold itself is not too large. And projection onto this subspace reduces the total variance of the noise by a multiplicative factor of d by n. This is because uh, the noise is uh, full dimensional in its covariance matrix. It's, it's identity covariance matrix with some scaling perhaps. So here is a picture of the original manifold in three dimensions with a PCA subspace in two dimensions. And it's just the idea that you project onto this two dimensions by just smashing it down. I've just put two points to show the intersection. So this is a very low dimensional picture. You don't necessarily want to think too carefully about it. So, so the first lemma says that when you do principal component analysis, you actually get something that is close to the manifold. So this is a lemma that we prove. I just take it for granted since I'm not going to have time for more, any proofs really in this talk. Uh, and uh, so now I'll start going into the technical details of uh, what will make the algorithm work. I haven't yet told you the algorithm, but before that I want to introduce some ideas. So you have these outer normal cones for, uh, for uh, any uh, 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 manifold which is contained in, in the boundary of its convex hull of the kind we're looking at. Uh, so this is the picture. So now suppose the manifold were just a set of three points, one point here, one point here, one point here. This is not the kind we're looking at. We are looking at manifolds of dimension one or more, but this is just for illustrative purposes. You can consider this such thing and the mixture of Gaussians falls in this category. So you have just, just three points and uh, you, uh, this is our manifold. So now they form a triangle. They're not collinear, that doesn't fit into our picture. So they, they form a triangle and the outer normal cones are these angles. The angles of the outer normal cone are these. So these are the outer normal cones, this one, this one, and this one. There's just three of them. In general, there'll be a whole family of outer normal cones. So if you think of a curve in R3, you're going to have a bunch of such cones at every point on the curve. And they're going to be moving slowly. So what the preceding lemma said was that these outer normal cones for C21 manifolds vary smoothly. So you don't suddenly find a thick outer normal cone and you move very little, you suddenly find that it's become very thin. That does not happen for C21 submanifolds. This is the amount of regularity that you need to ensure that that doesn't happen. Okay, so, this, so, so let me just tell you right off, right off what the algorithm is so that you, you can, uh, I think you'll be, it'll be easier to follow the rest. So the basic idea is going to be first somehow get a hold of the uh, convex hull of this manifold. Secondly, start solving random linear programs on the convex hull of this manifold. And when you solve these random linear programs on these convex hull of this manifold, you're going to start getting these extreme points. And this you already see here, right? If I take a random linear program, a random direction like this, and I try to solve it on this triangle, I'm only going to get one of these three points. I'm not going to get anything else. I'm never going to get a point on this line because that's a probability zero event. So that is going to be the idea. Are you going to get the manifold by first getting hold of the convex hull in some way, and then start solving random linear programs on the convex hull? Okay, so I just wanted to tell you before and while this picture was there so that you can motivate. So, so the, the way to solve these very general kind of 
uh, linear programs is to use uh, oracles in the setup of Grotschel lower than Shriver. Because these are not linear programs given by, in which the constraints are given by, by fixed number of linear subspace, uh, uh, hyperplanes. These are constraints, these are somehow very implicitly defined uh, uh, constraint sets. And I'm going to tell you how they are, you get to get hold of the con constraint set. Uh, so uh, this is the basic problem first. This weak optimization problem. Why is it called a weak optimization problem? Because the, what you're required to do is kind of weak. You don't require to find the exact optimum. You're, for, you're expected to find an epsilon approximate optimum in some sense, in the sense that uh, it has to be uh, better than everything that is strictly contained inside the convex set. So I think here a picture would be helpful. So, so if this is your convex set, then this, this slightly bigger thing this is k, this is s k epsilon, and this inner thing which you get by looking at all points whose distance from the boundary of this convex set is greater or equal to epsilon, this is s k minus epsilon. Okay. So what do we mean by uh, the weak optimization problem? You basically, given a vector c and a rational number epsilon, you are required to find a point in this in this in this outer set that doesn't do worse than any point in this inner set okay and if this inner set is empty you just can say that it is empty and so that you are not required to do anything okay if the inner set is empty so you somehow rule out these very ill conditioned instances by this so for example this point is okay but this point is not okay with respect to this objective vector because this point does better than this point in terms of going in this direction So we also have a weak validity problem. So now how, how do we know what the convex set is? You know what the convex set is by an oracle, which, which is itself obtained by solving a weak validity problem. So this weak validity problem basically tells you, uh, uh, given a C, it tells you uh, what is the value of the maximum of the linear program up to this epsilon approximation. Okay, so you, what, what you, this is something that we will have to separately solve. So, we, so basically, why do we know all these uh, weak validity problem solutions? We know the weak validity problem solutions. Uh, I'll uh, t tell you. So this is in a second. But but this lemma is it tells us that uh, uh, from basically uh, that it is possible to construct an epsilon weak validity oracle that is correct with high probability with some bounded number of uh, uh, sample. So you have a bound on it. It's not a great bound, but you have a bound with the number of samples. It doesn't depend on n, the ambient dimension. It does depend on v and uh, tau raised to d in a rather bad way. Tau is the reach and d is the intrinsic dimension. So this is how we solve the weak validity problem. Remember, what are we trying to solve here? We are trying to tell, we are, we are trying to basically say uh, what is the objective value of a particular linear program on a convex set. So what is the opti optimum value, not the point? We are not required to find the point. That is the that is what the grotschel lower shriver machinery does for us. What, this Oracle, this will tell you what is the value of the linear program opti at the optimum. So another way of thinking of this is that if I give you a, a, a hyperplane far away, it will tell me the distance of the manifold to the, to the hyperplane. And this is true for every far away hyperplane. This is the same as saying it, uh, it's a weak validity Oracle. So how do we how does how do we implement a weak validity oracle? What we do is we take all these samples, we take a somewhat far away hyperplane in the direction we care about, and we just count how many samples have fallen in this region when you take a random point here and and add a random Gaussian noise vector. Okay, so when you do this, uh, the the number of uh, points here will be something, but the the thing is most of these points come from here. The, the reason is that the tail of the Gaussian is so extreme, the chances of a random point coming from here all the way up here is much smaller than the random, the chances that a random point from here come here. They're both small, but the chances of coming from here is much smaller. So all the points that have managed to land in this region have very likely come from a very thin band around this point. And that allows us to relate the number of points that have fallen here to this distance, simply using the 
formula for the Gaussian. And this way we evaluate the distance of this hyperplane to the manifold. Okay, so and once you know the distance of the hyperplane to the manifold, the, the machinery of Grotschel, Loa, and Schreiber allows you to solve, solve the optimization problem using the ellipsoid method. So this lemma is saying that it is possible to solve weak optimization problems for polynomial time given access to an oracle that solves a weak validity problem. Okay, so this is the idea. And so now there are numer numerous uh, numerical uh, stability issues that come into the picture. So I'm going to talk about those in the remaining 20 minutes. So firstly, if these cones are very thin, that's not good for us. So, we, so these are the, those outer normal cones that I showed you in the triangle picture. So we need those cones to be thick. Uh, uh, if you put together the condition on capital R and the condition on reach tau, you can show that these cones contain a ball of radius tau by R uh, inside uh, the outer normal cone at a, at a unit distance from the, the point you care about. Okay. So, so they do contain large balls with these if you have guarantees of, on tau and R. So, uh, so this is the stability issue. Uh, so what we're saying is that, uh, so we're not going to be able to solve the, the linear programs exactly. So this does not tell, give you the solution of the linear program exactly. But can you, if you have an approximate solution of the linear program, we don't want the, the, the point to be very far from a point on the manifold, right? So this, this but this is actually true with, with all the guarantees we have on R and Delta. So if what happens is, so what is delta? So I'm, I'm taking a random objective vector, remember. When I take this random objective vector, this random objective vector, it belongs to a certain outer normal cone, a, a unique outer normal cone. But it could be very close to the boundary of that outer normal cone. So this outer normal cone is D minus D dimensional. Okay, D is the ambient dimension after the dimension reduction, the PCA dimension reduction. D is the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. So these are D minus D dimensional cones. And uh, these, uh, uh, the delta is the distance to the boundary of this cone. Okay. So, uh, so I'll just draw a picture. So this is the cone and this is the direction. This is delta. Okay. How far from the boundary? And so the lemma says that if you get a good epsilon, then when you solve this linear program approximately, you guarantee that the true optimum X is not too far from the obtained optimum Y. And how far is it? It is this far. So as long as delta is not too small, this being the delta, uh, uh, this is a reasonable bound. It turns out the delta is actually quite small and that blows up the runtime, but nonetheless, it gives you some bound. Okay, so, uh, so why, why do we get that square root of uh, epsilon r by delta? The reason you get square root of epsilon r by delta is you are able to solve the linear program to within an epsilon error in uh, objective value. So what happens therefore is that when you have this ball, you, you can chop it off at epsilon and you are guaranteed to be in this sector. Not, and it's not called a sector, it's like a, a piece of this ball. You're guaranteed to be in the piece of this ball where this, they, this, this amount is epsilon. Now in a radius R ball, if this amount is, is epsilon, this is not a radius R ball, I'm sorry, this is a radius R by delta ball. You have an R guarantee on the best possible ball at that point, but when you take the objective vector, you have now make the you have to make the ball contact with the point in question at the with a normal that corresponds to the objective vector. And when you do this, the, uh, the it's no longer an R ball you're looking at, you're looking at an R by delta ball. Okay, so this is R by delta ball, this is epsilon, and the diameter of this set is square root of R epsilon by delta. So that is why you get to within R epsilon by delta of this point. And this, this gives the guarantee uh, of, of the point. So, so basically, this is the procedure. You, uh, but, but there is a catch. You need a procedure which excludes cases when the point output by the optimization routine applied to V is far from the base point of the fiber containing V. So you don't want to pick up a lot of 
spurious points that are that you think are close to the manifold where actually none of them are and how 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 can you tell whether a point is spurious or not so now i'll give you a a way of of pruning out the bad points it may prune out some good points uh, it, it actually doesn't prune out any uh, good points yeah it, it, it just prunes out the bad points so what is it so so you think of this cone you have a cone this is the outer normal cone but you have taken a section of the outer normal cone so this is a three dimensional outer normal cone you've taken a two dimensional section of this and what you have got is this polygon here this two dimensional polygon is a section of an outer normal cone now these objective values are sticking outside the the screen they're looking at you the, the directions they're pointing in your direction and uh, what you're doing is uh, you are going to try to say that uh, if uh, this is your uh, i'm sorry uh, okay so if if this is your uh, vector v what we are going to do is we want to check that this is a robust point as as far as the optimum is concerned so what we're going to do is we're going to take a small ball sample that ball and solve lots of linear programs corresponding to each point on that small ball okay so this is like a, a very large number of linear programs are going to be solved and if all of their solutions in terms of the points they, at which approximate optimality is obtained are clustered very close together not even one of them is far away then we are going to pick one of those clusters and this one of those points and just say okay this is roughly a point on the manifold on the other hand if if these points object if these uh, uh, linear program solutions are not clustered together then we're going to discard the point saying that this point v this vector v was too close to the boundary of its outer normal cone and the resulting solution of the linear program was unstable and we don't trust that the solution that we got is actually close to the manifold we want okay so this is the criterion that's going to rule out all the bad points and why does this work this basically works because if you have any point in a outer normal cone it is always possible to get one point that is a good point on the sphere namely this point it's moving towards the center of the outer normal cone whatever that means and when you do the optimization with this point you are guaranteed to get a good uh, a good solution because it's so close to the so close to the interior of the outer normal cone that uh, the the bad things that happen with small delta don't happen here and you're going to get a good point so every such perturbed optimization problem which when you do all these perturbations is going to produce at least one one uh, trusted point that you can trust because you have one trusted point in that set and if all the points are clustered around you know that all of them are trusted because they are all close to that one trusted point it's guaranteed to have one trusted point on the other hand if there you there's a split and some are close some are not close then you can't say anything okay so this is the criterion we use to rule out the idea that uh, this, uh, this these linear programs are are unstable or not okay so now we also need to say that the, the chances that a random vector v uh, actually is a good vector is relatively high and that is done by a lemma so the, it's a volumetric lemma you do some volumetric computation and show that actually the chances of being somewhat far from the boundary of the outer normal cone is somewhat large and that is done by this lemma so uh, um, so let me now uh, again i'm going to i have already told you what the algorithm is but i'll just go through it uh, in a slightly uh, uh, slower fashion so uh, uh, let us assume that this is the number n of points that we need so you see that this is capital r by tau d plus d b over epsilon to the d this is a large number of points and this is the number of uh, points that we need to uh, basically going to use so this is a large number of points and here's how algorithm find find points works so for one less or equal to j less or equal to n0 you do the following you sample a random vector vj from the uniform measure on the ball then uh, for this random vector on the ball you take a small ball around that point this is that uh, and then you solve lots of these perturbed linear programs and then let uh, let uh, the, let y i j be the solution of weak optimization problem which c epsilon optimizes this over z belonging to k with high probability and if we have that all the perturbed linear programs have solutions that are very close to the uh, original linear program then we accept the point y y j set it to y 1 j otherwise we output no point and declare that the vector vj was itself within r not of the boundary of the outer normal cone so it was not feasible to do the optimization 
Okay, so this is roughly the algorithm. And you do this sufficiently many times, you get lots of points on the manifold. So this is the main lemma that, that tells us the final answer. It tells us that the number of arithmetic operations performed on points with n, coin, uh, n coordinates uh, use, using the, during the execution of fine points is bounded above by n, n not. So n, if you recall, was the, was the number corresponding to the, uh, the complexity of the validity oracle. And then there, is some, there are some polynomial terms corresponding to solving the linear programs. But this is uh, basically the time complexity. And if, if we know that uh, the dimension d is less than c log log root log log n, and all these are constants, then the bound on the time complexity is, is polynomial in the original ambient dimension. So this is, these are the kind of guarantees we can give. So now what do we do with all these points? Well, we want to produce a manifold at the end of it. So we take all these points, and then we, we first fit disks to them. Okay, so this is some basis follow, follow, you know, it's called basis pursuit or something. So there's some algorithm to find disks on, uh, on using the points. We find these disks and then we fine tune the disks so that they're rather close to being uh, points on the, uh, containing the corresponding tangent spaces. And now what we do is we take bump functions on these disks. So what are these bump functions? Uh, so these bump functions look like Gaussians, except that they, are, they have compact support. So, <clears throat> so if, if this is our manifold, what we're going to do is we, we, have, we get all these points that are approximately on the manifold and they form a relatively dense net on it. So we have some local algorithm that fits these disks to the manifold. So th these disks are one dimensional, since the curve is one dimensional. I'm, I'm just drawing this ball because this ball is the radius within which you look at the points. You don't care about points here when you're trying to draw a disk here. So you get all these disks. And then you somehow weld these disks together to form a manifold. That's the algorithm, which I'll tell you now in some slightly greater detail. So here, so this is what would be the case if you had a two-dimensional manifold. You have all these two-dimensional disks, and you have these bump functions, which are uh, locally defined on these disks. So there's a bump function here, there's a bump function here, there's a bump function here. But the good thing is that when you add up all the bump functions projected onto one larger line like this, they locally add up to one. Okay, so these are called partitions of unity. They're very useful in analysis. So you have one bump function on this red ball, one bump, bump function on this, one on this, and they all add up to one locally. So on this red ball, if you add up all these functions, you'll just get one everywhere. And that follows from the normalization you do here. You do this normalization, you divide by the sum, and this, that just ensures this condition. And it's possible to choose weights. So this is a theorem, it's possible to choose weights so that this alpha tilde z is within universal constants uh, of one. Okay, so you can compute this using some Voronoi tessellations and things like that. So this is this picture. So what are these objects now? So now there are two, there are going to be two objects. One is this vector field. So given a disk, you take this vector field which measures the gradient of the square distance to this line here. Okay, so if you take the square distance to a line, the gradient is going to keep increasing as you go farther and farther away. And that is what you see here. Okay, so this is the gradient of the square distance. That is one object. And there's a second object, which is what's called a vector bundle. The second object is, is going to assign, so I'm going to draw, use it in this. So, so the second object is going to assign a subspace to every point in a neighborhood of this manifold. So you have this manifold, you have this tube around it. By now you approximately know the manifold because you have all those data points, those points obtained from optimizations. And uh, so for every point here, you have some approximation of the normal fiber to this manifold, something like this. It's not exactly this, 
but for every point you have this and the, the important thing is it varies quite smoothly with, with the position. Okay, so this is not only defined on the manifold. For any point here, there is, there is rooted at this point a subspace that is kind of like the, norm like the normal to the manifold at that point. It's called dimension D minus D, this, uh, these things, these subspaces. In, in our case, now D is 2 and uh, D is 1, which is why you are getting D minus D equal to 1. And these fibers are one dimensional. Okay, so these are these two objects. And once you get, so this object is obtained by basically uh, taking those projections onto those disks, getting this corresponding projection matrices, taking this linear combination using the partition of unity of the projection matrices to get a, a matrix for every point that is not a projection matrix. This is a positive different matrix, but not a projection matrix, but it looks a lot like a projection matrix because all the things that are getting mixed together are very close to being the same. So all the projections that are getting mixed together here with a non-trivial weight are very close to being the same. That's why this is this has got a few eigenvalues that are very close to one. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, D minus D eigenvalues that are very close to one, D eigenvalues that are very close to zero. And from this, you can just threshold to, to get the projection that you want, okay? And what is the formula for the manifold? In the end, the formula for the manifold is simply, uh, so, I'll, so this is that uh, thresholding I talked about. You get the AX and you take, you take the high eigenvalues, you take the eigenspaces spa corresponding to the high eigenvalues, project onto it, and that's how you get pi X, the projection. And what is the manifold? The manifold is a set of all points where the projection of F of X, the vector field, uh, is zero onto the corresponding fiber. So how, how is the vector field obtained? So I think I, I didn't describe that carefully enough. Uh, so th you have these vector fields fi, you are going to patch them together by just adding, uh, uh, so this is actually the vector field, this is the vector field, these are the fi are the vector fields for each disk, you add them together with a, with a, with a uh, weight and you get the vector field for the overall vector field, you get the overall vector field. And similarly, you do something, this A is the matrix you get by putting together all these projection matrices. And then you take the high eigenvectors of it and take the span uh, and project onto that. And that's how you get the pi x. And now this is the manifold. The manifold is simply the set of all points where pi x of f of x is equal to zero. f of x is a vector field. Pi x is a, is a, is a family of projection matrices that keep varying smoothly as x varies. Okay, so it's not just f of x equal to zero. It's not just that the manifold is a set of all points where the vector field is zero. No, you have to take f of x, you have to pass it through this other filter of pi of x, which, which projects it onto the certain large eigenspaces. And then you get zero. And then that is, that is the manifold. Okay, so that is the, that is the summary. Uh, so uh, so here, is, here are the, the, the subspaces you're going to project on. So it's, it's like the picture I drew here. Uh, and, uh, and the final result is that for arbitrary values for the parameters d, sigma, r, lambda, tau, v, theta, epsilon, our algorithm produces a description of a manifold M0 of reach at least tau by d to the 6, which is the Hausdorff distance to M0 is less than epsilon, with probability at least 1 minus eta. When d is less than root of log log n and all the other parameters are absolute constants, the number of arithmetic operations is bounded above by n to the c. So it's polynomial when this d is very small in this sense. The questions for the, for the future include what if M is not uh, containing the boundary of the convex hull? And can we uh, relax the condition that D should be less than root log log N? And lastly, can the guarantee on the reach of the output manifold be improved? Currently, we have a lower bound of uh, tau by D to the 6. So this is my last slide. Uh, any question? If not, then uh, let's thank the speaker again and uh...